Jeremy, are you picking me up now? Cool. Um, so welcome to our True Transformer session. Uh, this is really exciting for us um, because this session is actually the reason that we started planning this entire event. Um, thanks to some uh, funding from the Helen Jones Foundation, we got a grant that allowed us to support a number of projects um, that were led by Texas Tech faculty members to engage undergraduate students and you're going to see a really wide range of activities um, and opportunities. And we're really excited about the things that the folks have been able to pull off so far and then some of the projects are still going to run through the end of uh, December even. Um, and I'm excited to say that our funding has already been renewed for next year and so those of you that are faculty in the room Please, um, if uh, these sorts of things sound intriguing to you, um, then uh, uh, come talk to us because um, we're, we're looking to, to pass out more money for 2023. Um, I'm loud, so you probably can hear me just fine. I'm going to guess that some of our presenters are not quite as loud as me. And so those of you that are at the um, back of the room, especially if you get close to this big old projector with the loud fan, you may find that it's a lot easier to hear if you sneak forward. And so I'll leave it to you, but in general, I recommend that you come this way so that uh, it's a little bit easier to engage. Um, I think, uh, JC, have, I, I guess let's, let's talk about the format of the session. I think that's the next thing. So if you were with us to start the day, we had our impact talk session where undergraduate students spoke for three minutes apiece to talk about their project and they actually were reviewed by their peers in the session and two of those students will be selected to go on to the finals tomorrow and compete for prize money and so first prize takes home 500 bucks um, the worst they can do i think is 100. Um, and so uh, that format is in some ways being extended unfortunately there's no prize money for y'all today so i apologize so um, we are going to keep time just to help everybody kind of stay on pace but it's a little less militant so if you got cut off this morning don't don't feel bad if if uh, the folks in this session get another sentence or two they're not competing um, but uh, for our next session as a heads up again we'll be doing those three minute talks and that will you'll have a timer and we'll, we'll kind of cut you off um, <clears throat> are there any questions about this session um, before we get uh, on with kind of the formal program? Great. So I, next, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask my boss, um, Dr. James uh, from the provost's office, to come up and just talk a little bit about how exciting our partnership with the Helen Jones Foundation is and uh, the importance that Texas Tech places on these kinds of projects and opportunities. Well, welcome everybody. Um, you know, without the Helen Jones Foundation grant, this wouldn't be possible. So that's first and foremost, we need to really appreciate, be appreciative of, of that grant that they had. And again, the, the continuation of that the next year and the exciting things that can happen. Um, as Levi mentioned, so in, in 20, what, 16, we started a strategic plan. And part of that strategic plan, uh, something that came out of it is an, an attempt or a desire to make sure that every undergraduate on campus had a transformative undergraduate experience. And hence, the uh, Center for Transformative Undergraduate Experiences, or TRUE, came out of that. Um, so I, I hope that everyone in here has had such an experience. I know I'm, a, I'm the president of an honor society, and when we have our national convention, I'll ask people to raise their hand. So I have about 250 honor students from across the, the nation. How many of them feel like they've had a transformative experience, a transformative experience in their life? And about two thirds raise their hand. So we still have about one third that don't. And in fact, that's kind of consistent actually with uh, other undergraduate bodies that I've spoken to. So one of the things that we know is transformative is when we get faculty mentors paired with students, that that can transform your lives. It's incredible. I look back on my experiences a long time ago that I had a faculty member who challenged me in ways I couldn't have imagined. In fact, I'll tell you, I was a decent student as an undergrad. And my first time ever that I had uh, an exam, it was in thermodynamics too, I'm an engineer, that uh, the professor said, it's open book, open note. So I'm thinking, open book, open note. I've never been able to walk into an exam with a sheet of paper. I'm thinking, I've got this, no problems. Made a 29 on the exam. It was the hardest exam I've ever had at to that point in my life. Now, the good news is, the next three exams, I was the top of the class, but I realized I had to study and this person challenged me to no end. I ended up taking this person five times and did a senior thesis. 
So that's the impact, hopefully, that you're also having with your faculty mentors. And, and, and believe me, faculty mentors typically love to work with students. So it's a great opportunity. Next year, hopefully, you'll uh, continue. The faculty mentors will continue with this. Again, the Helen Jones Foundation, thank True for all that they're doing. Um, this is exciting. I, as I was walking by and looking at the posters, the posters out there, they're amazing. So the quality of work is done is amazing. Congratulations to you and look forward to this. Okay, so um, Dr. James did a great job reminding me of the one thing I forgot to tell you all, which is please, on your way out, check out our project posters in the hallway. We're really proud of those. And thank you all so much for the time and, and uh, energy that went into to putting those together. Um, I think with that, we're ready to get rolling. Um, and so if our first uh, presentation group wants to come up, then I'll hand you the mic. All right, hello, y'all. My name is Max Fry. I'm Noah Byford. And uh, we are representing the West Texas Children's Chorus. And so the West Texas Children's Chorus is an organization that was founded to be a beacon for kids to have a musical experience all across West Texas. And so we, uh, we work with kids K through 12, and there's also the college interns, which is what we are, that also get that experience of not only getting to work with these kids, but also seeing the behind the scenes of how an organization is ran. And so um, we work with kids K through 12, and some drive as far as an hour and a half to come rehearse with us. So it really is an opportunity for these kids to get a musical experience and work with professional musicians and really, really get to have that experience in West Texas. Okay, so my buddy Max here, he is actually a music major. I am not. I'm a kinesiology major, but I love music and I love to sing and I love kids. Some things that I've grown to see in the West Texas Children's Chorus is that these kids challenge me as a musician. Some of them are crazy talented and I'm like, dang, I wish I knew how to sing like that when I was your age. Or like I had a group of boys that I was in charge of when we went to DC and I had to walk them through the parade and that was such a cool experience. But they challenged me to be a better leader and challenged me to see like, oh look, look how they're growing and see how I needed to grow with them. Um, so the coolest thing is the WTCC, we take kids to places that they never would have dreamed of going. Last year we took a DC trip and we got to sing in the Cherry Blossom Parade and the kids sang and did a little dance and it was all cutesy and fun. But most of all, these kids got to see the District of Columbia. They got to see things that they didn't know existed. Like some of the kids were like, oh, I didn't know there was a monument for World War II. I didn't know that the Lincoln Memorial was that big, like things like that. Or we went to the Smithsonian. They were like, oh, that's the first American flag that was ever built. Like that is awesome. So they got to see those things and experience those things through our little deal too. And so coming at this from a college student perspective, I was able to get the experience of knowing how to program a trip and knowing how to get the behind the scenes kind of work on it. We brought over 100 kids to Washington, D.C. Um, getting K through 12 kids on a plane and safely to D.C. is a miracle. And so having that behind the scenes kind of experience with Dr. B and being able to learn and learn how to orchestrate these things is extremely valuable as a college student because that's what I will be doing as a choir director one day, whatever grade level that may be. And so that was truly an invaluable experience. Uh, I was getting to work with someone who's truly the best in her field, Dr. Brumfield. And so as a college student, um, uh, that experience is going to help me for years to come. And so these kids also had the opportunity to work with extremely professional musicians. So we were able to sing at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church and uh, work with uh, in the DC Met. We worked with musicians from the DC Met there. We got to perform church services there. And so that kind of experience, not only from a college level and for kids, is something that is truly special and will be remembered for the rest of our lives. So thank you. Hello, my name is Hallie Anderson. And my name is Jaden Owens. And we are part of the creation project Labyrinth. Now in our project Labyrinth, we first started out with a conversation of relationship dynamics. This is because our professor, Allie Duffy, went through a concept of push-pull in her previous productions. Now we talked about familial relationships, friendships, loving relationships, and relationships be between strangers. And we weren't sure right off the bat which one we wanted to choose, so we started improvisation and set choreography on 
our individual selves, and then worked around each other to figure out who we were to each other in this project. And once we added in our props, we found out at the very end of our project that we were familiar strangers. We weren't sure who we were to each other and yet somehow familiar. And her character had a better idea of who she was, where she was, and who I was, whereas my character had more of a lost, confused um, poise and wasn't sure who you were. So we discovered this type of environment through uh, what we called the labyrinth. It was comprised of a four by uh, four cube, which was 16 um, mannequins that we were um, challenged to dance around and explore. This um, just made our experience a lot more um, interesting and just easier to kind of get into the theme of the piece. It challenged us to work more so towards getting that stranger relationship that Hallie was just talking about more um, convincing within the piece instead of just kind of trying to think of that in our heads, just imagining it. Um, I feel that the mannequins also challenged us to move in a different type of way um, in terms of like typical traditional dance movement. When you think of traditional dance movement, it's kind of more so either ballet or modern or something um, that's more flowy, but this kind of in, uh, enacted us to be able to move in a way that's more stagnant. Um, also within the videography part of this, this uh, piece was filmed and it allowed us to explore this narrative even further with having to refilm certain parts just to get the narrative exactly how we wanted to portray it. So through this project, we found our theme, which was individuality in society, which is our mannequins. And it's hard to fit into a society, but also remember who you are and where you are and what your goals are. And that was our overall theme of the project. And I think that um, towards the end, the theme kind of fell more into place. We decided to go with this stranger relationship because it was something that we were really invested in and we wanted to explore something that we were really, really interested in just so that this could, um, get to a place that we were confident. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jared Foster. I'm a professor of practice in the College of Media and Communications. And the project that I'm going to talk about is actually one that was part of a joint proposal uh, with Dr. Justin Keene, who you'll hear from here in just a second. Uh, and I'm going to paint a broader picture than he will because he's going to speak on the specific uh, activity that we funded through our joint or our, our separate proposals. Um, but I want to make a, a really nice point, and this is probably going to be a tribute to True and a big thank you to everybody involved, including the Helen Jones Foundation. Um, we were able to fund uh, some extremely important and very high end uh, backcountry equipment that made. Uh, our projects and many more projects into the future, very possible for students to have these incredibly unique, innovative experiences that all centered around storytelling, uh, but are all inherently interdisciplinary. Um, there's a photography cliche out there that says, that says gear is good, vision is better. And that's, that's to downplay uh, a particular obsession with acquiring gear to think you're a better photographer than, than you really are. Whereas developing vision is, it's much more the ultimate goal. I like that, but I also think that vision combined with provided or supported resources used the right way is the best. We were able to, to acquire a little over $10,000 worth of backcountry camping uh, and experiential equipment. Uh, he'll talk more about what they were here in just a little bit. You can see one of the students there uh, using some of it. Uh, and it made our adventure media course that much more financially feasible for the students uh, and much more accessible where we went environmentally. But that's, that's, the, that's the short term. The long term is the vision orientation here. The long term is that this, just since March of 2022, this equipment, these resources have provided transformative experiences for up to, or not up to, for 43 students over a period of 32 days in the backcountry across three different courses or three different programs, I should say, 
Uh, and there's plans for in the net within the next 365 days to spend another 40 plus days in the field with up to 100 extra students, including another iteration of the adventure media course uh, that will keep compounding year after year after year. So investments in programs like ours creates transformative experiences for undergrads, but it also opens up a, 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 a world of opportunity uh, for students and faculty to collaborate together and create fairly innovative programs that ultimately uh, provide them with uh, incredible professional experiences, but probably the life experiences we also idealize them leaving an institution of higher ed like ours with. So I like this idea of gear is good, vision is better. And there's also this other cliche you're probably familiar with called if you build it, they will come. This is what's happening exactly here. And so thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Juliana Salinas under Dr. Arlene Garcia from the Texas Tech School of Veterinary Medicine. And my study was the use of alginate hydrogel beads during pig transportation. So this study is a lot different than the ones than the three previous ones that we heard before. This one is more focused on the animal industry and agriculture as well. So we're looking at the slide here. I'm just gonna give a little background. Y'all are probably wondering like, what are alginate hydrogel beads? So those are the um, I like to tell people that they're kind of like Orbeez. Um, we made them in our lab. We made the recipe and everything. Um, we're actually tied in with the USDA. And hopefully um, once uh, our study gets published, this will be a big national thing that will occur, all thanks to the funding from True. So those alginate hydrogel beads are fed to the pigs, which was a model that we used in this study. So when pigs are transported, they're in these trailers and they travel for long hours over a long period of time. Um, so they're very stressful. Um, maybe they can lose weight, they get fight, they fight a lot, they get hurt. So when they were fed these alginate hydrogel beads, the stress levels were decreased, which is a, a which was the goal for this study. So in the animal agriculture industry, our main focus is we want the animals to have the best care possible, right? So that's our main focus here. And through this, we uh, collected blood before and after, and this was used just to test um, for cortisol levels, which measure stress. And through this research, we found that with these alginate hydrogel beads, the stress levels were a lot lower. Um, and then we can have some pictures here so you can see those pigs there. Um, they're really big. They're there in New Deal at the New Deal farm um, at, through Texas Tech University. And overall, some of the things that we saw was that the body temperatures were higher and the ones that did not receive um, our alginate hydrogel beads. So we can see that those had a, those had a positive wear, welfare effect on the pigs, excuse me. So the ones who did get it, um, they were a lot more calmer, they weren't as stressed out, opposed to the ones who didn't, they had higher CO2 levels, which meant that they were um, overheating in these trailers during transportation. So overall, just the main focus of this was to mitigate the negative stress effects uh, that transportation has on pigs in this case, but overall, maybe in the future, we hope to apply to other animals involved in the industry. Um, and if you're wondering, like, how does this apply to the general public? So as consumers in the United States, um, maybe some of us are not, uh, maybe some of us are vegan or vegetarians and we don't prefer meat options. But those of us who do, um, we need to understand and we need to, we want to have safe meat practices for all of us. And that ties back into FDA and USDA regulations. So this was our main focus on the study. And um, right now we're working on getting it published. And I just wanna say thank you to everyone and thank you to True for making this research study possible. Um, and Dr. Hayes wasn't um, able to make it today, um, but I hope that everyone will go and look at her poster. Um, she is doing a lot of great things as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Justin. Uh, I teach in creative media industries over in the College of Media and Communication. So Jared is a professor of practice. He has a, a professional business as a photographer. I tag along as a person that had a background working in the ad industry, and now I'm a research professor. Uh, and so he's cool enough to let me come along for these classes. So Adventure Media, which he kind of teed up really well for me, Adventure Media is an honors college class. It's offered every spring. Uh, we take 15 students from all over campus into the back country. Uh, and if that weren't enough, we make them ride mountain bikes and live off of that mountain bike uh, for the entire time they're there. No one has ever uh, went with us that did not then come home with us. So we're safe there. Uh, that's a, we are a 100% hit rate there. Um, we're going strong. 
Uh, and so we have traveled to Big Bend Ranch State Park, Rio Doso, uh, New Mexico. This year we're planning on going to Las Cruces. We, we kind of go all over what is accessible during spring break without getting into uh, too much snow. So this was this year. Uh, when we applied for our funding through Tree Transformers this year, Jared and I wrote kind of companion pieces. And what it was intended to do is specifically reduce the overhead cost for our students in this program uh, that they would typically incur on things that they're probably just not going to use much again, right? So uh, a sophomore from Plano is, does not need to spend $500 on a tent. Um, they might be able to, and that's awesome. Whenever I was a sophomore, no thank you, could not have afforded, right? And so we want to provide that kind of safe, uh, quality, lightweight, transportable, useful for multiple classes kind of equipment to our students because ultimately there, there's this really goofy cliche like on Instagram, other places like outside is free. Outside is free if you own a $6,000 bike and the $2,000 of clothing and the $1,000 Garmin and the $1,000 bike rack, then it's free, right? Like it's not. And so we realize that for our students and we have worked really hard with partners uh, like True and, and others to reduce that cost so that any student on our campus that wants to get outside of a normal classroom wall and go put to test what they're learning on bubbles in tests in, in our classrooms normally, we give them a chance to say, hey, why don't we go like practice this? Well, let's go see if you really know how to do it. Let's go like get outside of your normal life, your normal rhythms, and let's go do something really cool, right? And so the things that students tell us when they get back from Adventure Media is, this is life changing for me, right? I wanna pick a different career now. Uh, which I'm like, awesome, talk to your parents too, because I don't want to get sued. Um, you know, like, I'm, I'm a parent of five, like, I might be upset if my kid came home from college and had that, that change of heart. But, you know, I want to change my career. Um, you know, can I go again next year, right? The number of repeat students we have is indicative of the experience that they have, not because of Jared and I, frankly, it's because of the experience they have. When they get back to the parking lot at the tech parking, uh, the police department where we park every year when we leave, they are a part, they join a part of an alumni base within an alumni base. We've been doing this class since 2016. We take an average of 15 kids a year. There's not a lot of students that have done this class and they get back and they have this community where there is still an active group me from last year of them talking and, and being in community with one another. And so because of True, they're able to join that at a lot lower buy-in and we could not be more thankful. So thank you. Okay, awesome. So good uh, afternoon, technically, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andras Horvath. I am a graduate student in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, uh, studying statistics. Um, and I'm here on behalf of Dr. Jacob Kirksey to present on one of our projects we did during my undergraduate degree, which was uh, titled Shared Identities, Short and Long Run Benefits of Demographic Representation in Middle School and High School Math Courses. So a lot of what we were doing over the course of almost two years, basically, was uh, trying to answer a question that for STEM and uh, mathematics specifically based fields, there's a lot of underrepresentation by black and Latinx minorities. And we were curious, how can we help these students that need it the most um, in those classes? So we were curious, does having a same race or ethnic teacher, so a black student with a black teacher, for example, um, in one particular class lead those students to be more likely to advance to the next class in the sequence, be more likely to go to college when they wouldn't have planned to beforehand with the ultimate goal of whether or not those students uh, would someday maybe enter those fields which they weren't planning beforehand. So a lot of this stuff with education policy was, as we can see from all these numbers, a lot of it was just statistics and a lot of econometric models. So we spent tons of time learning Stata and other statistical software packages uh, in order to uh, run these tests. Most of it was data mining and going through all the different data, um, finally running the tests, uh, interpreting results, and then speaking with a lot of PhD students in the uh, education department who are working professionals that are teachers, they are uh, principals, and having those working professionals versus someone who's a full-time college student is a great experience to see that difference, which, I mean, otherwise I would never have had, to help us answer those questions we didn't know we had in the first place, and then on top of that to start presenting at conferences. I mean, we presented uh, at two different conferences for education journals, uh, Eli, Elijah Hand uh, presented on our behalf, and then on top of that, um, we have been working on manuscripts for, uh, for publication. So we're trying to combine it with some other, um, some other papers currently for publication. And I definitely would like to thank True and the Helen Jones Foundation without which I would not have been able to do this. And it definitely made a big impact on me as uh, I'm actually continuing my education doing a master's in a very similar 
related field statistics specifically. So um, definitely would not have been possible without them. And uh, it's definitely an experience. I at least hope that every undergrad is at least given a chance to do. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's all I have. Um, hello, my name is David Vizcaino, and I work with Dr. Larry in our Student Perceptions Research Lab, uh, in which we are measuring how undergraduate STEM students perceive their instructor's mindset. So when we say mindset, we refer to how professor perceives their students' intelligence. Can they improve the way they learn? Do, uh, do they have the potential to be STEM professionals in the future? And are they able to change the way they learn in their class? Previous works have been focused on the outcomes of these mindsets and how it affects the students overall such as the academic performance gap within their class or psychological, psychological vulnerabilities. But we're focused on the mechanisms of, of such outcomes and how they come to be. So to do this, we have interviewed undergraduate students of four different universities across the country. And we had them answer a survey in which they inadvertently told us what mindset they believe their professor to have. And they, they do this by answering questions that say, what, do, what things do the professor say? How does he act around the students? What are the course policies that he enforces? So our end goal was that we can create a guidebook for professors everywhere that highlights how they could interact with their students to promote student morale and performance, which in the end is gonna benefit them as well. So this is an ongoing project. So currently we have just entered a coding stage, which is finding themes and patterns between the students' responses. And after conducting and transcribing all the interviews, we, even though it is the initial stages of coding, we're already seeing some interesting patterns, such as equal treatment of the students and provision of additional resources being positive factors uh, that, that really have a, it have a, has a positive outcome on students' motivation to work in the class and how they perceive the professor. So regarding the, the impact this research had on me, um, before this, I really had no experience in research whatsoever. So working with Dr. Mary has been a really inclusive introduction to the world of research in academia. So much so that after seeing the intricacies and, and how everything works and the discovery that comes with work like this, I even consider this as a, as a future career goal for myself. And so thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Lockbaum. I'm a full professor here. I've been here since 2000. I'm in sport and exercise psychology. So uh, three minutes is like a small suggestion for a, <laughs> for a, for a professor. Uh, I've had that problem before. Uh, I'm Lockbaum of the Cooper and Lockbaum. Sydney is a hard worker, and she's at Walmart working a double shift uh, to pay for college. So a professor of sport and exercise psychology. Mood is part of the work that I do. I've done for, forever. And so I have a job, a research position in Lithuania. And so what Sydney and I put together uh, with our colleagues, my colleagues in Lithuania, now Sydney's colleagues, uh, we did two things. Both of these have been published. And so we're excited to, you know, you push it forward. You do it and you, you don't leave it. You keep it going. And so mood, regardless of culture, right, is, is we know moods matter. Levi would have felt the weight of our negative moods, because I've been in a place that's done this, where we talk at noon and then we eat later, because it's the notion that eating together would be so great and what a powerful bonding experience. We could take photos, I love photography, well, I take photos of it. We would take photos of people being really upset. That's what we take photos of, right? And so you have to have, to do mood research, you need a validated measures in everybody's language. Not everybody speaks English, and so, we worked on that with uh, something that's called the Brunel Mood Scale. If you might be in psychology, you might think of the profile of mood states, that type of, that type of scale. We did that, very successful, and then we took it to our mood determines health choices that we make, and then our current health status can determine, obviously, our mood. And so uh, Lithuania must, you know, it's, we do large, large data collections, very exciting, and it's a country of, of let, you know, smaller than Dallas, so we can get a lot of people very quickly and have a national sample. We found great support for different mood profiles of how a person's health impacts the mood and the mood impacts the health. This will allow my colleagues in the country of Lithuania 
to use a validated measure then to make interventions, both on the health and the mood side, to improve everybody's health, right? Uh, for the, the last part, which is the most important part, right? Um, we gave our Lithuanian colleagues a great measure. Uh, Sydney, no, apostrophe S, uh, is going to go on to get a PhD in radiology. Right? We'll be more excited if she does that at Midwestern as opposed to UT San Antonio, right? Our moods will be very different. And I've done this, I've done this, uh, somebody helped me 30, 30 some years ago. And it's, it's the greatest thing ever. Thank you, very, Levi, as always, thank you very much. I am so very impressed that everyone has been speaking without notes. I, however, require a security blanket. So <laughs> it is often said of actors that we transform that our work is transformational as we bring to life as authentically as possible someone else's experience. The actors in our BFA acting and musical theater program are transformers today, truly, not only through our craft, but also as proud and grateful recipients of a true transformer grant. Hi, I'm Ronald Dean Nolan, Associate Professor of Acting in the School of Theater and Dance here at TTU. Uh, each year, our graduating seniors in the BFA program enroll in a performance course culminating in both a filmed and live showcase in New York City. Uh, this annual showcase allows our students to perform for agents, managers, casting directors in an effort to introduce them to the entertainment industry and in order to secure representation and begin to build a portfolio of professional work. It is one thing to visit New York City as a tourist, but quite another to live there. After living and working in the city for more than 20 years, working professionally, I knew it was important for our actors to experience the city not as tourists, but more as residents. The very generous grant we received from True Transformers was instrumental by affording us the ability to, quote, live, unquote, in a hotel with a kitchen and in a neighborhood on the Upper West Side, my old stomping grounds. In, our, in short, our graduating seniors were able to buy groceries across the street at Fairway and live as if they had an apartment in the city. Rather than taxi, we walked or took the bus or subway. In addition to Broadway shows, off-Broadway productions and smaller theater productions were experienced. We walked across the Brooklyn Bridge, among others, among other things, uh, something pretty much uh, only New Yorkers know to do. And with so many of them relocating to New York City upon graduation, True Transformers made it possible for them to know that the city isn't out of reach, that West Texas, uh, life goes beyond West Texas, um, that, it, that it is indeed a viable and wonderful place to pursue their careers as actors. Uh, again, we couldn't be more grateful to you, Levi and True Transformers and the Helen Jones Foundation for this invaluable experience of giving our students uh, a beginning to their professional lives with the support and backing of their university. Uh, they all are in New York, scattered about the country now, and some in Chicago, a couple in Los Angeles. Uh, now that this current year seniors are in classes, either singing, dancing, and working, I'm here with you. Uh, they're here in spirit, those who are gone, and represent TTU very proudly and very professionally. I'll miss them terribly, of course, but we are excited for the next showcase adventure in New York City this coming May. Uh, we are truly grateful. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Esimisen Akra, and today I'll be talking to you about the relationship between food insecurity and financial literacy in a college student sample. Food insecurity is prevalent among college students, and in 2019, it was shown that it ranged from about 10 to 59 percent. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, food insecurity has increased. Now you may be wondering, what is food insecurity? Food insecurity is simply a situation where there is an unknown or restricted access to adequate food as a result of the economic resources available for food. So there are many problems associated with food insecurity, giving rise to numerous coping techniques, such as the use of food assistance pro pro programs, and also not eating when hungry. Now, unfortunately, there is a social stigma surrounding this issue 
and it could cause students not to use the resources that they recognize on campus. Now this brings me to one solution that could help alleviate the problem of food insecurity, which is financial literacy. There is a relationship between being financially literate and having food insecurity. In fact, it was shown that households that experienced food insecurity lacks the basic financial concept. With this information, our research team has two objectives. One was to identify the characteristics between food insecure and food secure students. And secondly, to examine the relationship between financial literacy and food insecurity among TTU students. And in order to do this, we carried out a survey earlier this year from the spring, which extended to the summer. Right now, we are doing the analysis. We expect to see that students that experience food insecurity have a lower level of financial literacy as compared to students that might be food secure. In the very near future, we plan to hold a nutrition intervention and a financial education intervention with the Red to Black organization at Texas Tech University. So, My goal personally at the end of this intervention is that the students have the basic financial skills or budgeting skills in order to plan for a proper diet. So far, it's been a wonderful research experience, and I know that at the end, it's going to impact a lot of students' lives. Thank you also, True, for funding us. Hi, my name is Erica Martinez, and I'm a third year psychology major. Hello, my name is Elijah Velasquez, and I am a, a senior here at Texas Tech University and also a prospective clinical psychology student. So we are here to talk about our ongoing research study that has been possible through True, the Transformers grant. So what the study is looking at is the generational disconnect and connection that one feels with their caregivers. So what we did for the study is that we recruited participants through the psychology participant pool, SONA, and what we did is that we conducted in-depth interviews with these participants regarding how disconnected and connected they feel with their caregivers and um, possibly specific instances in which they felt that way towards their caregivers. Um, so, so far we have finished the interview process and we're about to go on to finish transcribing all these interviews and then coding, and that's where the undergrads come in. One of the things I really wanted to put a big point on is to be able to do this qualitative um, type of research. Uh, I'm in multiple labs right now, and this is the first lab that I've actually been able to do in-person qualitative analysis. So I got to shadow uh, some of the grad students and be able to be in a around 40 minute interview. That experience is so valuable, especially when it comes to um, making your application as strong as possible for the next level when it comes to clinical psychology and those type of things. One of the things that made it so valuable as well is once those interviews were done, uh, being able to talk to the grad student and ask them, why did you do, um, why did you say what you said? Or um, in, what, in this situation, how would, you, how would you alter what you're about to say? So those in-person uh, qualitative experiences are invaluable because you get to be able to see person by person and your interviewee by interviewee um, these different situations and how you'd handle them, which also gives the grad students the opportunity to be able to, in a sense, um, refresh in their mentoring skills and to be able to realize, why am I doing this? This is the best way to explain it to an undergrad student. Yes. Also, another thing that we got to do with this um, Transformers grant is that, again, allowing us to shadow with these interviews. It's not something you see very often in labs. Um, I know it's a really special experience because you get experience for clinical psychology, but also transcribing is something you don't see that often. So getting that experience for future research projects as well has been very helpful. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Christy Rogers, and I'm an assistant professor in human development and family sciences, and I am the director of the SIBS lab. So this stands for Social Influence on Brain and Socioemotional Development. This is my crew. You might recognize a few of them. And I'm really appreciative, so grateful for this funding opportunity from True and from the Helen Jones Foundation. It has had an incredible influence, not only on my lab, but so many of the students in my lab. And so we have these five students that I was able to fund over the summer because so many Texas Tech students work so hard to make a living, right? And I wanted them to be able to focus on research activities. And so we had five underrepresented students in science, and you can see them up here. So we have um, Bailey and we have Lainey. They are students in HDFS in my department. 
We also have Annabelle, Ashlyn, and Tina, who are students in psychology. And these ladies contributed so much to a study that we actually launched this summer called the Texas Sibling Study. And the study investigates family influences on adolescent regulation and well-being across time. And it takes into consideration influences from neuroscience, family science, and developmental psychology. So they're exposed to a bunch of different theories and methods. And they are actively involved in the entire research process. So you see Ashlyn and Tina here are actually helping to develop an experimental task that we administered with these teenagers, where we actually videotape them and will later actually code those observations. Annabelle is actively involved in recruiting. She's actually on a phone call with the parent there. And so she's been instrumental also in helping to develop materials to recruit families and communicate with them. We've also collected data with 10 families. So these ladies have been involved in working with teenagers and parents and helping to administer surveys, these tasks that you see here, and also preparing them for fMRI brain scans. So they've been involved in the entire process. And you see Lainey and um, Bailey up there, and they're actually playing around with these brain models because we've done some outreach activities as well that they have been involved in, which has been super exciting. So there's this event called Tech Savvy here at Texas Tech, and they bring middle school girls on campus. And we did a neuroscience workshop, and these ladies got to be involved in these really, really enriching outreach activities, which has really inspired them. They're all still actively involved in the lab. Four of them are applying to graduate school. Well, three are applying to graduate school right now, and one will be next year. And Lainey is actually going to be starting nursing school in January. And this has been pivotal, pivotal in our process. So she obtained a scholarship this fall and went for nursing school here at Tech based on some of these research experiences. And then Tina and Ashlyn have also accrued funding from the College of Human Sciences, which is incredibly exciting. And this funding is going to help them go to a conference this spring to share some of their preliminary findings based on the study which they're actually talking about here today. So Ashlyn spoke this morning, Tina will speak this afternoon. But just to summarize very quickly, Ashlyn's looking at these problematic eating behaviors in teenagers and seeing how families can negatively and positively influence those behaviors and also how they associate with anxiety and depressive symptomology. And Tina is very invested in learning about an assessment tool. Ashlyn is as well. But Tina's uh, project fo focuses in more detail and terms of improving this tool for clinicians to use in therapy settings with teenagers to better assess their mental health and well-being. I'm very excited and proud of these ladies. Thank you again for the funding. It has changed not only myself in the lab, but also their trajectories in science. Thank you. Can we give our projects one more round of applause? <laughs> Thank you for finding your way through the maze of everything to get over here today. Um, and thank you all for being with us for lunch. Um, I, I hope you see some of the potential and excitement that's building with these things. And we're so excited that we're going to have another round of funding. And so I hope you all are um, thinking about ways that we can partner again. And uh, um, if there's anyone in the room that missed the boat last time, um, we, we'd love to talk to you about how we can partner moving forward. Um, so uh, I believe this session wraps up right about Oh, hey, now that's handy. So cool. <laughs> so um, our next impact talk session starts in about 45 minutes by my watch. Um, and so we have a little bit of a break here. I encourage you to um, go get three more boxes of chicken salad sandwiches um, and, uh, you know, squirrel away some Dasani water for, uh, um, you know, a dark time. And uh, <clears throat> It, it, hang out here, but then um, we have actually three parallel um, sessions or rooms going this afternoon, and so there will be a whole host of students that will be coming in, and so if you've got a little bit more time to spend with us this uh, afternoon, I know it's a Friday, um, we'd love to have you stick around and um, jump into one of those rooms, and do we have the room numbers? I believe, so one of the sessions will be in here, you'll be stuck with me, I believe, in 150, 110, which is back around the hallway, at, and then 120, I think, is right next door, are those three rooms that will be happening at 145. So please um, grab some coffee, some more food, and uh, thank you very much for being here.